Continuing our journey in thermodynamics, we're going to do part one of section 16.4 where we'll talk about Gibbs free energy. Um, so there's our learning outcomes and expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those. Yeah, so so far in chapter 16, we've gone through spontaneity, defining what it is. Then we used entropy as a way to uh, talk about spontaneity or give context to spontaneity. And then we did the second and third law of thermodynamics that basically says spontaneity must increase for a process to be spontaneous. And in 16.4, we're going to talk about free energy. And because this is such a dense section, we're going to actually break it up into two parts. Um, first, we'll talk about the Gibbs free energy, which was what we'll be doing with this presentation. And so we talked about the second law of thermodynamics, right? For a, a spontaneous process to occur, there must be an increase in entropy of the universe, right? And so we have this, if delta S universe is positive, that is final minus initial is positive, it's spontaneous. If it's less than, a, a, a entropy of the final is less than the entropy of the initial, then it becomes non-spontaneous and it would not occur. And then if we have a delta S of zero, the system is at equilibrium. And so in order to do this delta S universe math, we essentially need to know what happens to the entropy of the system and what happens to the entropy of the surroundings. Now previously we talked about the entropy of the system, right? If our system is a reaction and it's not exchanging matter with the external environment, it's a closed system, then we can do this math right here from tabulated values. We can take the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants and that'll give us the, the standard entropy of the overall reaction or the delta S of the system. Now delta S of surrounding uh, it gets a little more complicated, right? So we know system, if we know surrounding we can do delta S of universe. The problem is, if we define our system as a reaction flask that's exchanging heat but not matter, we can do that delta S math. But delta S surrounding gets really, really hard because that's everything else in the universe, right? Everything except what we've defined as the system based on the boundary that we've created. And so the hard part is that's impossible to measure, right? We can't measure the, you know, whatever number of light years across the entire universe is. We can't measure the entropy of the entirety of that. But if it's a closed system, we know the only thing that's being exchanged here is heat. And so if we know how heat affects the surroundings, we gain insights into the change in entropy of the surroundings as impacted or as dictated by the reaction. And so uh, thinking about this in terms of the local environment, we have our system, we have our surroundings, and for a closed system, the only thing we're exchanging is heat, right? So for an exothermic reaction, energy is being created by the reaction and it's being released to the surroundings and it's heating up the surroundings. And so something we know about this, if, if it's an exothermic process and delta A, uh, H system is negative, it means it has to be heating up the surroundings. And so we know from our, our, our entropy or qualitative relationships we talked about in section 16 point two is if the surroundings are heating up it means the entropy of the surroundings are increasing and so it essentially tells us if it's an ex exothermic reaction that means the delta s of the surrounding is positive that means the entropy of the surroundings is positive alternatively if we have an endothermic process we have the reverse right we have a heat is being um or energy is being gained by the system by heat transfer and that means that the temperature of the surroundings is effectively going down right and so it means we're, we're seep, uh, seeping energy out of the surroundings which means we have a negative delta s of the surroundings and so we have this relationship so we don't necessarily have to measure all of the surroundings but we do know how the surroundings are affected by the system through this um, negative delta h or this delta h of the system and so if it's an exothermic process entropy of the surrounding is going up. If it's endothermic, the entropy of the surroundings is going down. And so we have this uh, proportionality here, which we can um, uh, turn into an equality, where the delta S of the surroundings is equal to the negative delta H of the system over the temperature. And so we have this, this proportionality between delta H system, delta S surroundings, um, by uh, one over the temperature. And so this becomes really important when we look back at our equation for predicting spontaneity. We have delta S the universe, delta S the system, delta S of surroundings. And delta S is a system we can calculate from our, our standard um, uh, entropy of the reaction. But delta S of surroundings, now we have a proportionality that we can insert in there. Instead of doing just delta S of everything in the universe, all of a sudden we can insert this into the equation. And then that's really important. And so we can rearrange this a little bit, multiplying everything by T, and we get this relationship here 
here. And so we can see negative t delta s universe is equal to delta h system minus t delta s system. And what's important about this is all of a sudden we have this equality where we have delta s universe, which we want to figure out. We want to know whether it's spontaneous or non-spontaneous. If this is positive, it's spontaneous. Negative, it's non-spontaneous. But now we've defined it in terms of the system, right? This delta h system, which is whether it's exo or endothermic. This delta s system, which we can calculate from the standard entropy. And we have temperature, which we can measure of a system and so we've defined all most of these parameters in terms of the system and that allows us to calculate delta s to the universe and so the person that orig originally did this was Josiah Gibbs and so now we call this a Gibbs free energy relationship and so the Gibbs we replace this minus t delta s universe with this delta g and it says delta g is equal to delta h system minus t delta s system again defined in terms of the system and the temperature that we can measure that tells us delta g of the reaction and so that's known as the Gibbs free energy equation and it, it, it basically tells us what's the driving force for a reaction to occur and so much like delta s universe we can predict whether a reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous based on this the sign on delta g and so remember um, we have delta minus t delta s universe is equal to delta g and so we have the same relationship here it basically says if the delta g is a negative value that means delta s universe is a positive value that means the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction uh, conversely if delta g is positive and delta s universe is negative that means the reaction is non-spontaneous as written as in reactants on left products on the right that's non-spontaneous but it is spontaneous in the reverse direction and so if we get a positive delta g non-spontaneous negative delta g it's spontaneous and if delta g equals zero that means delta s universe equals zero and the reaction is at equilibrium and so much like we did with uh, enthalpy and entropy, we can do a standard free energy of reaction or this delta G of reaction or standard delta G of reaction. We can take any reaction. We can look at the Gibbs free energy of the products, Gibbs free energy of the reactants or the, the free energy of formation of products and reactants. And we can figure out what the delta G of an overall reaction is. And so in this case, we're using that, that, that little not symbol. That's the standard free energy of formation is the energy to change, uh, the free energy change that occurs when one mole of compound is formed from its elements in their standard state. Uh, basically the same equation we did with enthalpy and entropy, but now we're going to do it with Gibbs free energy. So it's stoichiometry times the, the free energy of formation plus stoichiometry times free energy of formation of products minus the same thing for reactants, and that gives us a delta G for a reaction. And so we can essentially do this for any reaction, right? If we have, we know what the reactants are, we know what the products are, we have these tabulated val val values in the back of the book, or you can Google, um, you know, Gibbs free energy values. And we have our enthalpy, we have our entropy, and we have our Gibbs free energy of formation. And so again, we can take what's the stoichiometry of reactant A or product A or product C in this case, stoichiometry for product D, so on and so forth, and do this calculation. Uh, so just for fun, we'll do a quick example of this. We want to know whether this process is spontaneous. If we can calculate the delta G for this reaction, we can figure out whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. So we have carbon in the form of solid diamond. We have oxygen in the gaseous form, and we have CO2 in the gaseous form. And so we have this equation. Delta G of reaction is equal to delta G of products minus delta G of reactants. We can put our uh, uh, summation in there. And so in this case, we have one product. So we have one times the stoichiometry, uh, the Gibbs free energy, and then minus the reactants. In this case, we have diamond plus oxygen. And if we go to our tabulated values at the back of the book, we can put numbers into this equation. And so we have the stoichiometry here. It's one to one to one. So that makes the math relatively e e easy. Um, but we can see the CO2, the delta G of formation is negative 394. That goes here. And then here's your reactants. O2 is in its elemental form. So the Gibbs free energy of formation is zero. And so that simplifies the math again, but you can essentially plug and chug the math from there. And you can find out the delta G for this reaction is negative of 397.3 kilojoules per mole. And so if delta G is negative, which it is here, it means delta S of the universe is positive. It means that this reaction is spontaneous. And so spontaneously, diamond combines with oxygen to give you CO2. Note, it doesn't tell you how fast it's going to happen. All it tells you that this will happen and the delta G of the reaction tells you it will happen because the delta S of the universe is positive.
And so what about non-spontaneous reactions? There are certain non-spontaneous reactions that it's really important they do happen. And one of the ways to make a non-spontaneous reaction where the delta G is positive, to make that happen is to couple it to a reaction that is a negative delta G or a spontaneous reaction. And so here's a pretty important example of this. Um, if you have industrial ore, um, if you want to make metallic zinc, the thing you actually dig out of the dig out of the ground is this zinc sulfide. But one of the problems is is that the the, the, the zinc that we want is is uh, bound up in this zinc sulfide, and so um, we really need this zinc. We need to isolate metallic zinc. We need, in fact. 2,000 tons of zinc metal per year, which is a lot. It's used for a lot of different applications. Uh, but the problem is this is a non-spontaneous reaction. And so if you have zinc sulfide, it is never going to turn into zinc metal and sulfur uh, solid. And it's because this delta G is a positive value. It's 201.3 kilojoules uh, per mole. And so this, this reaction just does not occur. And so what they do on an industrial scale is they do something called coupling reactions, where they'll take this zinc sulfide going to zinc solid plus sulfur solid, and they'll couple it to a zinc sulfide or zinc solid or sorry, sulfur solid, combining with oxygen to give you this uh, SO2 gas. And it turns out this process is very spontaneous. This one is a negative delta G of 300. And so if you take this negative delta G spontaneous reaction and couple it to a non-spontaneous reaction, you can draw an overall reaction that looks something like this. And so while this one is unfavorable, non-spontaneous, this one is spontaneous. You combine the two of those together, you just add these numbers, and you can see that this overall reaction is spontaneous by 98.8 kilojoules. And so, yeah, we can take a non-spontaneous reaction, couple it to a spontaneous reaction, give a spontaneous process overall. And so this is really important. This is how 95% of zinc is actually produced. And so you take this, this ore feed, this zinc sulfide, plus a bunch of other stuff, and you heat the heck out of it in the presence of oxygen, which gives you this reaction here. So O2 plus sulfur, uh, giving you SO2. Then you get SO2 off gassing here, and then you can actually uh, collect a bunch of uh, metallic uh, zinc from the system. And so, yeah, the take home message is, we have a non-spontaneous process because the delta G is positive. We have a spontaneous process. The delta G is negative. If we combine those two together in one overall reaction, we can drive this reaction forward in a spontaneous way um, by having an overall negative delta G, which means the reaction is spontaneous. All right, so there's our introduction to Gibbs free energy. We have the Gibbs free energy equation. Delta G is equal to delta H system minus T delta S system. Uh, it's basically we're defining a delta G or the entropy of the universe in terms of parameters that are um, uh, based on our system, right? Delta H system, delta S system, as well as temperature that we can measure. And so this delta G represents delta S universe. And so if D delta G is negative, it's spontaneous. If it's positive, it's non-spontaneous. If it's uh, delta G is zero, the reaction is at equilibrium. Uh, and so now we have this convenient notation. We can also define uh, whether a reaction is spontaneous from tabulated values. We go to the back of the book and we find the delta G of formation of products and reactants. We do products, sum of products minus sum of reactants we get a delta G of the overall reaction. And uh, we can calculate whether it's spontaneous based on the sign of delta G reaction. If it's negative, it's spontaneous. If it's positive, it's non-spontaneous. Um, yeah, and so we can get that from tabulated values. Finally, we can take these non-spontaneous reactions and make them spontaneous by coupling them. So we can take a non-spontaneous plus a spontaneous, and if we combine those two together and the delta G of the overall reaction is negative, then it's a spontaneous process overall. And so that's called a coupled reaction. So yeah, that closes out part one of Gibbs free energy. Uh, next, we'll get into uh, how temperature affects that delta G relationship, and we'll talk about uh, equilibrium and how that relates to delta G.